Uh, let's see, some big stuff has happened this week. <clears throat> it looks like the electoral people have made their decision, and it looks like the popular vote has made its decision, and we have a new president. And so uh, I, I got to be honest, I'm conflicted up here, guys, because uh, I've had several conversations with people that... Uh, 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 let, let, how do I put it? There are some people that are rejoicing and ecstatic and, and, uh, and uh, optimistic about the future and have a great big smile on their faces. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm one of them. I, I think, I think, I, I think uh, we were lucky. However... I also have spoken to uh, church members that have uh, a real anxiety, a real concern, and a real fear about the direction. Uh, so it's hard for me to stand up. On one hand, I, I, I want to, you know, feel one way, and on the other hand, I'm mindful of uh, there are some people that are have genuine concern, and so. Uh, that was the whole plan behind today's sermon, guys, is whether we are optimistic and jumping on our chairs or whether, for whatever reason, there is a fear, an anxiety, uh, a despair. Either way, I want to remind us of something very, very important, and that's the point of this sermon. You might want to make sure you have a handout so you can follow along and take some notes, uh, but so... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, guys. All right. The title of the sermon, Whose Plan Wins? Whose Plan Wins? I was kind of trying to be a little contentious there. Maybe some people think the, the, the Republican plan. Maybe some people are thinking the Democratic plan. But there is a third plan that's floating around out there. And that's the one I want to draw our attention to. We're going to draw our text from Psalm 75 because there is someone in that psalm who shared... Uh, having forgotten his perspective, someone that had the wrong perspective for a short amount of time, and then it was brought to his attention, the reality of things. So, because we are finite, guys, God is omnipotent, God is eternal, no beginning, no end, so God is not afraid of ever running out of time. Time is of no concern for God. And so He can plan things to take place in 400 years, and that's a blink of an eye. He can plan for things to take place in 3,000 years, and that's no sweat to Him. But many of us, if we don't get our way within 10 or 15 minutes, we start buckling at the knees. We are finite. We are temporary. We're going to see an end. And because of that, we need for things to happen quickly. Otherwise, we might feel some despair. That's the problem with being finite. We're afraid of running out of time. And that is something that God does not share with us. So our minds are finite. We can't always see the answer. We can't always see how what's happening today is going to roll out over the next three, four, five hundred years. And that's the perspective that I want to bring to you is some people are very, very focused on the next year, the next four years. And I want to remind us that we have a God in heaven, a sovereign, omnipotent power, creator of the world, that He makes things happen in tens, hundreds, and thousands of years. So let's talk about this idea of being finite. Because we are finite, because we can't always see how things are going to work out, and we, are, we have an immediacy uh, let me remind you that that is a part of our humanity, probably pretty normal. Let me read to you a couple powerful figures in the Scripture who 
even though they were in touch with God, had communication with God, there were times when they forgot the big picture and they had anxiety and despair over the way things looked. Let me just give you a few real quick. Habakkuk, Habakkuk in chapter 1 and verse 2. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you don't hear me? I cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Despair and anxiety. Habakkuk was a prophet who talked with God. Now at the end of the book of Habakkuk, he remembers what we are going to remember today. And Habakkuk, at the end of his book, is able to say, even if there's no milk in the stall, even if there's no figs on the vine, even if there's no grapes, I will still have faith in God. He found his footing. And that's what I want to give you today, footing. Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah, We hope for justice, but there is none. We hope for salvation, but it seems so far from us. Isaiah felt despair for a moment. Mark 15, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So this idea of being nervous, this idea of feeling like, wait a second, things are not working out. Where are you, God? That is a normal human emotion, despair. Because of that normal, human, carnal, finite emotion, we're always in danger of losing perspective and not behaving like bold, powerful, faithful Christians. Sometimes we can draw up in a little cocoon because we lose perspective because of despair, anxiety. Men are very pragmatic, confident in their ability to problem solve. And so we begin problem solving. Every channel you turn on TV practically has somebody who's problem solving. They're predicting what's going to happen. They're predicting what we need to do because of what's already happened. There are a lot of guys who have a lot of opinions Because they think that they have the cure. They think that within themselves lies the power to fix everything if everybody would just listen to me. We can lose perspective. People get upset. People get frustrated when they cannot manifest their personal desires when they can't figure out how to further their own agenda. And if we lose sight of what we're going to talk about today, people can become desperate, and that's not your best self. So, we're going to look at a song. This is an actual song that was written to remind Israel whenever they feel despair, whenever they feel like their plans aren't working, Sing this song to remind you not to lose perspective. When it seems like your agenda is failing, when it seems like you can't imagine how you're ever going to recover from whatever's happening, sing this song and it'll remind you where your focus needs to be. So let's look at that song today. It's going to be Psalm number 75. It's a psalm of Asaph. If you ever wanted to sit down and read the whole story of what we're going to talk about today, read Psalm 73 to Psalm 83. Psalm 73 to Psalm 83 are 10 psalms written by Asaph, and they all deal with the problem of despair, worry, concern, and then remembering where we need to refocus. So let's look at the psalm today. It's called to the choir master according to do not destroy. This is a psalm of Asaph. He says, we give thanks to you. O God, we give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. And then here's the voice of God. At the set time that I appoint, put a square around that, that I appoint, 
I will judge with equity. And when the earth totters and all of its inhabitants, it is I who steady the pillars. I put a square around that. I'm the one that holds things together when you are in despair and fear and concern. Personal pronouns. Love those. Verse 4, I say to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with a haughty neck. Because it's not from the east or from the west. And it's not from the wilderness that comes lifting up. Verse 6 is a powerful, important verse. But it is God who executes judgment. He puts one down and lifts up another. Verse 8, For in the hand of the Lord there's a cup, foaming wine, well mixed, and He pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. But I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. So the title of the sermon was, Whose Plan Wins? And I don't mean the conservative plan or the liberal plan. I want to remind you of the only plan that matters, and that is what God has planned. Isaiah verse 46 gives a clear statement that God is the one who is unrolling His agenda in a time where we're going to hear someone that is unrolling an agenda Hopefully it aligns with God's. That would be fantastic. We'll rejoice at that. But at a time where people are unrolling agendas, competing agendas, we want to make sure that we are most convinced that ultimately God is the one with a plan and His plan is going to succeed. Nothing is going to derail what God has planned, no matter who's in office. Let's look at it. Isaiah 46 and verse 9. He says, I am God. There is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I declare to you the end from the beginning. And from old times, I tell you the things that have not yet been done, saying, my counsel will stand and I will accomplish all of my purpose. Verse 11, I have spoken, I will bring it to pass, I have purposed, and I will do it. That is a powerful section of text. And I hope that in this season, when we're hearing people talking about their plans, we pay attention and we participate in our material reality, but ultimately the Christian has a transcendent view. No matter what's going on in council rooms, no matter what's going on in board meetings, ultimately as Christians we have a transcendent view and it is this thing right here. I am God. I am the only God. There is no other God. And God reminds us of His omnipotence. He says, I tell you what's going to happen in the end from the very beginning. I tell you all the things that have not yet happened before they actually happen. And that is where our comfort and our faith stands. God says, I have spoken. It has been written it will, I will bring it to pass. Whatever I have decided is what I am going to do.
I just want to exhort you to not be confused as to who is really in charge. We are finite. God is eternal. The passage of time... Oh, man, I, I, I'm hearing somebody else saying the passage of time is the passage of... I better not go, go on. Uh, let's see. The passage of time does not concern God. And let me remind you guys of that. How does God's plans unroll? What do they look like? And let me remind you of a couple examples of how God works. Genesis chapter 3 and 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, you will strike his heel. How long did it take for that vision to be fulfilled? From Adam and Eve to the cross, 4,000 years. God did not have a problem waiting for 4,000 years. God did not have a problem with what was going on in history. God never got nervous. God never got afraid. God never second-guessed whether or not He was going to be able to accomplish His plan. He said, in 4,000 years it is written, I'm going to do something that's going to change the world. Again, when He spoke to Abraham, Genesis 15, 13, the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not their own, and they will be enslaved, and they will be mistreated for 400 years. It's written, I've decided it. Slavery and mistreatment for 400 years. There is something profound. Imagine how many four-year presidential terms are swallowed up in a period of 400 years. Is there any one of those four years out of that 400 years that could derail God's plan? Is there any four-year period? Hey, let's talk about two terms. Any eight-year period that can derail God's 400-year plan? Abraham, again, God spoke to him. Abraham uh, found himself uh, living in a time where there was weak... Uh, it's not international policy, it's uh, foreign policy. Abraham lived in a time where there was weak foreign policy, and him and his siblings were getting attacked by these evil Amorites. So God talks to him about it. Genesis 15, he says, uh, In the fourth generation of your descendants, they are going to return here because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Abraham wanted a change of cabinet, and he wanted a military that was strong enough to get rid of these evil people, these Amorites, Right now, please, God, they're a thorn in my side. I wish they were out of office right now. And God says, well, I am going to kick them out of office. God talks to Abraham in 2000 A.D. Joshua is the one that defeats and destroys the Amorites in, 16, in 1400 B.C. So Abraham, you're right. I am going to kick them out of the office. It's just going to take 600 years because their sin, their depravity has not yet reached its full measure. And I need to wait until there is no hope before I'm willing to destroy somebody. So we're going to wait 600 years, Abraham. Boy, many of us had difficulty making it through four years. Daniel, one more, Daniel was shown a vision. Daniel has, been, has seen uh, Jerusalem destroyed. Babylon came, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, burned everything. Uh, Daniel is over in Babylon, uh, which is, oh man, Nineveh. 
Where, Nineveh. That's Iraq, Iran. That's the Middle East. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Iraq or Iran. But uh, Babylon, Nineveh, is uh, where Saddam Hussein was the, the king. That was his area. In fact, they say Saddam Hussein was trying to imitate uh, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Anyway, Daniel is over there. Daniel has had to learn their language. Daniel has been forced to participate in their government. Pretty bad for Daniel. And so Daniel is crying out to God, God, how long are you going to let this go on? We want our nation back, our country back, our temple back. We want it back to the way it used to be, God. How long are you going to have to wait? Daniel chapter 2 and 44 God answers them, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people, and it will shatter all the kingdoms and bring them to an end. God showed Daniel a vision where he said, Daniel, you're going to get what you want, but first you're going to have to live through the Babylonian empire and then you're going to die. After the Babylonian empire is going to come the... Uh, Medo-Persian Empire. Oh, I hope those are in the right order. And then that, that uh, world power is going to go, and then they're going to be swallowed up by the uh, Alexander the Great, the Greek Empire, and then they're going to be swallowed up by the Roman Empire, and then in the time of the Roman Empire, I'm going to answer your prayers. Daniel, you only have to wait 520 years. Are you beginning to have your eyes opened to the difference between God's plans and our own? I hope you can make that the dominant thought in your mind. God knows what He's doing, and God is in no hurry to do it because His plans cannot get derailed. Daniel, you're going to go to sleep and you're going to die. You're never going to see it happen, but I promise you, I will make it happen. I wish we knew the melody to Psalm 75. I think it's worth singing. We would need this information. Let's go on to verse 2. Psalm 75 and verse 2. Notice the pronouns. At the set time that I decide, I will judge with equity. When the earth totters and all the inhabitants with it it is I who keep steady the pillars. God is saying, you feel that there's an injustice. You feel that there is despair. The first thing God says, at the time that I decide. Not at the next midterm. Not at the next whatever the political rallies are. Those are what we see in our material world. Those are when we expect things to change. But I want us to transcend that. We want to be involved and we want to try to effect change without being misguided that God is the one that says, hey, when I decide is when I bring change. I judge with equity. I'm not like you. I don't make mistakes in my judgment, when the earth begins to totter and all of the inhabitants with it, when things get shaky and all of us have anxiety and despair over what's happening, God says, hey, I'm the one that keeps things together. If you're enduring four years of absolute chaos and mayhem, hey, I'm the one holding things together. Things are still being held together even though it looks to you like everything is coming unraveled at the ends. So believers cannot act hopeless and fearful whenever things look shaky or go south because we recognize we have Faith in the invisible, we believe and we trust that God is holding things together. 
Later we read in Hebrews chapter 1, Jesus takes that role on. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. He upholds the universe by the word of His power. The text tells us that Jesus upholds the universe. If Jesus can uphold the universe, light years of galaxies, then can we trust that He's got a grip on what's happening in Ukraine? If Jesus holds the universe together, can we trust that He knows what's going on in Gaza right now? You see, we've been called to see stuff that the normal material world doesn't see. They see what's happening before their eyes, and before their eyes it may look like the earth is melting, falling apart, but to the believer's eyes we go, don't worry about it, God has got this. Jesus is holding the universe together. Nothing is going to thwart Jesus' plans, God's plans. He's already got it all worked out. He already knows the end from the beginning. Before the Israel-Gaza thing ever popped onto the radar, God already knew about it. Before the Ukraine-Russian thing ever popped on the radar, God already knew about it. And we should have a comfort and eyes that a lot of our community might not be aware of when they feel desperate like things are falling apart. Now, let me put a pin in the sermon right there. Uh, I've been reflecting on this and, and uh, our children, and uh, I had a... I was on a snowshoeing trip one time, and there was a biology teacher on the snowshoeing trip with me, a big group of us. And so she figured out that I was a preacher, and so she walked with me, and we had a conversation. Biology teacher, high school or college, I don't remember which one. And she asked, Tony, why do you think our children, moms and dads that are Christians, but our children are not believers? They just don't buy into Christianity. Why do you think that is? And I said, well, you're a biology teacher. What did you teach your kids about biology? And she goes, oh, well, evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution. It's a fact, Tony. It's a proven fact. It's without dispute. Nobody disputes evolution is the way the world came, came into existence. And I go, but you're a Christian, right? Yeah, of course. So why didn't you say on the first day, God said, let there be light. Why didn't you go to Genesis, which is where Christians go? And she goes, well, because that's just poetry, and we know beyond any doubt that evolution is how the world came into being. And I go, that's why your kids don't believe. Because you say you're a Christian, but oh, no, 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 that Genesis story, no, 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 don't, don't believe that. Believe the science books. Oh, the political race, there's two, a uh, Democrat and Republican, and who's good and who's bad? Uh, pick one, you better pick the right one. Rather than saying, it's all in God's hands. God is the one who decides. If our conversation doesn't default to God's words, the way God said them, exactly the way He said it, then no wonder children don't have faith in the Bible because parents don't have faith in the Bible. It's going to be hard to pass on to the next generation something that that person themselves doesn't possess. Undisputed faith in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation I'll say exactly what it says, exactly word for word, and I'll be proud to say that's your truth. Not a science book, not a textbook. This is your truth. 
And you must be able to do that if you want to pass on faith to the next generation. I, uh, I, uh, let me share. The reason I can say that, guys, is because that was my mom. My entire life growing up, my mom would always quote a Bible verse. And I would get furious. Mom! Why can't you just talk to me like a mom? Just talk to me with your words. No, Tony, because what God said is the only thing that matters. And, and, and we would get furious. Don't give me Bible verses. Give me your opinion. No, no, because that doesn't matter. This is what God said. And I had that my whole life. I, I don't know what it must have been like to have been the person in the house that always quoted scripture, and had people getting mad at her for doing that. I don't know how many years it took, but by God's grace, at 55 years old, everything my mom taught me is now my truth. I, by God's grace, I'm afraid how we would have turned out if I wouldn't have had a mom that was always forcing scriptures on me. At 50, it might be too late to try to believe some of these stories. <clears throat> Christ holds all things together. At the time that I appoint, Jesus says, who's in charge? And the same thing goes whether it's somebody in despair over the election or whether it's someone that is jumping with glee at the election, which is fair. We participated. If you got, if you got what you wanted, rejoice and have fun with it. But, but I'm afraid I would not want us to... It's going to say we've got the executive branch. We've got the... I'm making stuff up, guys. I don't know all the words. Legislative branch. We've got the Congress branch. We've got the, some other branches, and we've got a Senate. And because we have all those, we have the power... And I'm afraid that we need to see beyond that and go, no, it looks like we have power. But the God of heaven is the one that is determining the times and the seasons. Let's not forget that in the midst of what seems apparent in our eyes. The God of heaven is the one who rules the one who studies the pillars. All right, let's move on in our text. Psalm 75, verse 6. This is a great little verse. It's not from the east or from the west, and it's not from the wilderness that will come your lifting up. It is God who executes judgment. It is God who puts one down and lifts up another. That text I love because that's a a Middle Eastern Semitic way of explaining something. He's saying when the world is teetering, when you're afraid, when you are in despair, don't run off to the east and look for help over there. Don't run off to the west and look for help over there. Don't run out into the wilderness because in those days they would send messengers and envoys out to the borders of the countries and get a feel for what was going to happen next. And then those horse riders come back to the king and report what's happening. Man, things look bad over here. Things look better over here. This looks like a better option than this. And they get their little cabinet together and they make their decisions. And God says, don't be misguided by that because that is not where the decisions are made. God says, I'm the one who is making decisions. I am the one who is going to lift up one nation in victory. And I am the one who is going to crush a nation in victory. I am the one who is going to decide whether Israel or Gaza gets lifted up and which one gets crushed. 
God says, I am the one that decides whether Russia or Ukraine gets lifted up or crushed. My house is where those decisions get made. Don't look to the right, to the left, to the cabinet, to the branches. God says, those are my decisions. <clears throat> they would want to go out to the Euphrates, see what's happening there. Go out to Egypt, see what's happening over there. Today, people run over to one of the branches, one of the cabinets to see what's happening there. Try to circle up the cabinet, the, the, the wagons. Get into committees and circle up wagons to fix things. But And even though we do advocate for getting involved, let's just not be misled that decisions are being made in heaven. Actually, the decisions have already been made before the things ever become realities. You better know that it comes from God. Psalm 33 and verse 10. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the people. It's the counsel of the Lord that stands forever. And it's the plans of His heart that go out to all the generations. A king is not saved by his great army. And a warrior is not delivered because of his great strength. The war horse, your war machine, is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. Behold, the eyes of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope in His steadfast love so that He can deliver their soul from death, so that He can keep them alive in famine. A lot of Palestinians in ancient Roman days thought that their grain came from Egypt. And that's what keeps us safe and well-fed, is Egypt not being far from us. They got all the grain. That's a safety net for us, is what they would think. But God says, don't put your hope in Egypt. Don't put your hope in your war machines. Don't put your hope in your military power. God says... I'm the one who protects those who fear me and those who hope in my steadfast love. I save you from death. I keep you alive during the famine. That is what we are called to believe in, church, a transcendent, invisible reality that can only be made known to us because the God of heaven has revealed it to us. Without the Scripture, without revelation, we would be just like all of the people around us, basing everything off of what our eyes can see. But the God of heaven sent a revelation out of heaven down to us in the form of a book. <clears throat> this is why Jesus, when He was Stumped by the ignorance of the scribes and the Pharisees, do you know what he always was telling them? Have you not read? That's Jesus' answer. Haven't you read? The answers are in the book that God gave you. Have you not read? And for those of us that do read, 
and believe and have faith and quote what we have read word for word exactly as it was written without compromising and without fear of blowback, we have been given insight to the transcendent reality that is actually the way the world works. We've been shown the way that the world actually works. And without this, people are only thinking, only believing that what their eyes can see. God Himself has spoken to us and given us the reality of the world. The reality is He is executing His plan Nothing will deter or derail His plan. His plan will be fulfilled. And unfortunately, sometimes it appears when people get too smart, it becomes harder and harder to believe the simplicity of the Bible because they know too much they've seen too much and they don't believe that things work out like this and so Jesus warns about that Matthew chapter 18 I tell you anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child. You're never going to see it. You're never going to enter into it. If you don't come to the Bible, to the Holy Scriptures, the revelation that was written down that came out of heaven, a transcendent reality that a lot of people can't believe, if you don't approach these words like a little child that is listening to his daddy and believe what your daddy is telling you, you'll never enter God's kingdom. One of the things that I've heard a lot in uh, the way the government thing is going, politics are going, is they go, yeah, Tony, but the experts, yeah, Tony, but the polls, yeah, Tony, but you need to understand what happens when you impose tariffs, you see what really happens, what really caused inflation, and man, they really sound smart. I can't argue with them because I don't know those numbers and stuff. But I'll tell you what I do know. I don't need the stats. I don't need the polls. I don't need the numbers. I don't need to understand what causes inflation. I don't need that stuff because I know who wins in the end. And I'm going to be like a little child at the throne of God. And whatever I see here is exactly what I'm going to believe. And God says, that is how you win. Going on, verse 8 in Psalm 75. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine. It's well mixed and He pours out from it and all the wicked of the earth will drain it down to the dregs, what does that mean? There's a Semitic metaphor. It's a cup in the hand of God. And what do you do with a cup? The standard default thing for a cup is you drink it. And so it's a metaphor that says, well, because you always eventually drink from this cup, God says, I have a cup of wrath. And guess what? Every evil person will eventually drink <laughs> from my cup of wrath. So when you are afraid that evil is winning, when you are afraid that the wrong person is going to do bad things, when you're afraid of evil, this verse says, hey, hey, trust me, trust me, because I'm the one with a cup of wrath 
And believe me when I say, the wicked of the earth will drain it down to the dregs. Do you know what the dregs are? The dregs, if you ever drink a glass of wine, when you get down to the bottom of a glass of red wine, the closer you get down to the bottom, you get all the sediment, all the pieces and chunks and gross little things that you don't want to swallow. If you've never had a glass of red wine, if you had a cup of coffee, old cowboy style coffee where they just throw the grounds right into the water, right? You get down to the bottom of that cup, you really start paying attention because what's down in the bottom of that cup, you do not want to swallow that stuff. And God's calling that the dregs. I'm going to make the wicked drink all the way down to the gross, disgusting stuff that nobody would want to drink. You're going to drain the cup of my wrath all the way down to the dregs. And so you can find comfort in that. Every last drop. Revelation warned about political alliances. The whole purpose of the book of Revelation was Rome was uh, propagating Caesar, the emperor, as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. That's what Revelation is about. A Roman emperor claiming to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and the purpose of Revelation is, don't you believe that? Don't you believe that? They look like they have power. They look like they are invincible. And they look like they're invincible. Boy, they got shiny Cadillacs and bulletproof stuff and huge caravans of guns following behind. They look invincible. You can't imagine anybody more powerful than them. And God says, don't you believe it? Because the God who sits in heaven is more powerful than them. So don't buy into your political climate, and that's the whole purpose of Revelation. Don't buy into your political climate because God is the one in charge, not Caesar. So here's what he says. Revelation 14 and 9, And then an angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured out full strength into the cup of his anger, and he'll be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of many angels. Pause just for a minute there, guys. That verse... Worshiping the beast, his image, taking his mark, all metaphorical. The beast is the Caesar. If you take his image on your hand and on your forehead, that is the metaphoric idea of what God commanded Israel to do. Do you remember? God says, bind my words on your right hand and on your forehead. That's metaphoric for saying, make sure you are fully buying into me, your God. Bind it on your right hand and your forehead. Now, if you choose not to do that, and you choose to ally yourself to the beast, if you choose to ally yourself to Caesar, and you bind his power on your forehead and your head, then you are going to drink the cup of my wrath. Don't buy into the politics, the clout, the power that you see with your eyes. Remember that it's what's invisible in heaven where the true power is. Don't take on any other name. Verse 11, the smoke of their torment will go up forever. They have no rest day or night. These worshipers of the beast and his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. And here it is. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Keep God's commandments and keep your faith. Because that's where the true power is at. This is an anti-political rhetoric. 
against the power of Rome, against the worship of the emperor. And that's a good wake-up call for us in this political season. Last verse, verse 10. All of the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horn of the righteous shall be lifted up. A horn was a sign of power. An ox or a bull or whatever, they got those horns. If you've ever seen like a bullfight, those horns are the bull's power. You take those horns off and he's not as intimidating. So a bull's horns, what you can get gored with, is a symbol of power. And God says, horns that are lifted up, powerful figures that get lifted up. Sometimes righteous people are the powerful figure that gets lifted up, a horn. Sometimes it's evil people that get lifted up. It's an evil horn. And God says, whatever season you find yourself in, if you're under a powerful, righteous horn, then praise God because God is the one that put that horn there. If you're under an evil, wicked horn that has put themselves in power, God says, don't worry about it because I will cut off that horn. And the horn of the righteous will be lifted up. Daniel finally got his hope. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel in the midst of it. Daniel was in the midst of evil horns. Wicked horns. God, what are you going to do? And even though Daniel voiced his concern, his desperation, his anxiety, he finally ends up saying this. Daniel 2 verse 19. And then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are His. He changes the times and the season. He disposes, deposes kings and He raises up others. Amen.